journalism is a history in a hurry of um, situations, circumstances change, history changes with time. And this is why we have this fascinating panel today with um, Jose Maria from uh, El Pais in Madrid, uh, who has been following the trail of uh, Franco era criminals from Spain in an investigation spanning years, almost more than a decade, um, to Latin America. And it's an ongoing investigation. So therefore, you would like to request you not to be uh, publicizing too much of the methods that he has used, and also the presentation that he is making will not be made public uh, just yet, since uh, I think you are at the conclusion of your investigations. So it's a very sensitive time for him. Um, and we also have uh, Catherine Porter who's with the New York Times in Paris, and she just rushed here all the way from the tragic earthquake in Morocco, from covering that. Um, welcome, both of you. And I think maybe we would like Jose to go first. And then I will be, even as a moderator, I'll be making a presentation at the end about uh, the project that I myself was involved with in Nepal. Jose. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is my first time in this global conference. Uh, thanks for the invitation, David and Andrea. This is for me an opportunity and it's an honor to be here. I will try to explain you this um, little crazy investigation. I said little crazy investigation because this investigation began 10 years ago. Um, for me and for my partner, uh, Joaquin Gil, uh, is not a job, this investigation. It's, it's just a, a mission. It's, we are going to, to, to talk about 10 years uh, trying to look for uh, a lot of uh, Spanish <coughs> criminal, far right criminals who do the terrorist, a very big terrorist attack in Spain, not the name. Mm, the context is very important. The, the, the context of this investigation is this man, it's a very, very popular man in Spain. You know, the, the, the Spain was uh, living under a dictatorship for 40 years without any break, as we imagine. The first democratic election uh, came in 44 years ago. Everybody was very, very happy, everything was perfect, marvelous, but uh, some small uh, groups, far-right groups, tried to stop and destroy the, 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 the new democracy in Spain with very, very big and terrible terrorist terrorist, 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 terrorist attack. The far-right groups um, um, was um, they did a lot of terrorist attacks. They were uh, inside a very, very small political party. The name of this political party was Forza Nueva. Uh, all of their members was a very, very young people. Uh, they um, did very, very terrible, terrible attack. And the target, in general, the target of these uh, criminals were lawyers, uh, students, and, and Germans. Um, they had just at this moment one representative at the Spanish parliament. They were few, few people, few, very small group, but they were very, very dangerous. Um, these people, these criminals, tried to stop the, the democracy in Spain. 40 years ago, to Journalists, my, my, my partner Joaquin Gil and me, decide to try to resolve these cases. Why? You know, because the majority of the, this criminal uh, have left uh, Spain very, very quickly. Sometimes the Spanish police and the, the judges arrest him, but sometimes they um, go left very quickly to, to America, to another different countries, and disappear for always. 
40 years after, my partner and me decided to try to locate this person and to try to resolve these cases. Uh, we have been working uh, for 10 years like a small team, just two persons, just two journalists. Uh, we, we don't have any, any pressure, we don't have any pressure, you know, because um, uh, we didn't tell anything about our bosses. Why? Because uh, we know that uh, the results of this investigation uh, were completely unpredictable. <coughs> completely. And we don't have in this time, in this uh, decade, any pressure because our bosses uh, want to uh, you know uh, the result of the investigation, want to tell us, please give me the, the, the story, you know. Uh, we have been working very, very slowly, very, very slowly. And we just um, um, began to talk to our voices when we have a, a good result, okay? Um, of course, you can imagine, for now, our journalists, we have been working. We have been working at the same time in another different uh, stories, of course, um, with the normal and, and typical uh, pressure of a big newspaper like in Paris. Okay. Our both methods, our steps, I am going to try to explain you the, the method, the technical, to try to look for these the criminals uh, in, in America. Mm, we uh, began, mm, the first of one, to be completely clear about your objectives, completely clear. In 2014, we made a special list, a very short list, with seven a terrorist with seven criminals uh, who is the, the main escapes, the main important criminals who escaped to, to, to America. Uh, we didn't have any 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 tips, we didn't have any information about the whereabouts of these persons. Uh, to be honest, we just uh, knew that some of them used to go very, very far from America, from Brazil, from Mexico, but we didn't have any specific uh, tips about the, the whereabouts of this person. Second, second, second thing I think is very important, uh, to know where to look for, to know where to look for this criminal, to know where to, to, to find the, the, the interesting information to, 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 to find these persons. Um, our newspaper, El País, uh, has a very, very big uh, archives inside the newspaper where you can find all the Spanish history, all the uh, newspapers of the, the 40 years ago, you have, you, it's, it's very easy for us to, to, to find information about this terrorist attack inside our newspaper. Second, the lawyers and the relatives of the victims. The, the lawyers and the relatives of the victims has been very important for us because they want to help us. They want to try to, to resolve the cases. They want to give us information uh, about uh, where um, living this person, if they are alive or they, they don't live in America or they live in another uh, country. Of course, the old judicial summaries. The old judicial summaries is, is like a treasure for us because in these old papers, old judicial papers, we can find uh, a lot of specific details about the criminals, the behaviors, the, you know, the, the, the specific terrorist attack. The police officer, the police officers who investigate this case. This source has been very, very important for us, you know, because now the majority of this uh, police uh, has been retired. And in this situation, this person, this policeman, um, used to are more free, you know, to give us sensitive and sensible information about the whereabouts of these uh, terrorists. Of course, the, this is very, very important, the family and friends of the criminals. Why the family and friends of the criminals? Because sometimes um, these people um, try to be or are in touch, you know, with the mother, with the father, with the sister, with the brothers, with the neighbors, with some people around him. And we have been in investigation, the, 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 the cycle, for the family to try to, to be if they are in touch, you know? to, to try to find some, some 
it to, 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 uh, to move forward the, the agreement. The former friends and the far right political circles. In Spain, of course, there is a democracy now, long time ago, but uh, this ideology uh, today is still alive. Uh, there are some uh, small um, radical uh, parties, very, very small, but they are completely alive. They present books, you know, they um, um, organize conferences, they are in a lot of um, um, political atmosphere in, in around Spain, and the leaders, the leader of these uh, radical um, Spanish far right parties, sometimes used to be in touch with one of so, so with some of these criminals. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes we have find interesting tips between this leader and the criminal that left Spain a long time ago. The social networks of the relative of the criminals. This is very, very important that you cannot imagine because this a criminal in general has changed their names, but usually change the names but are in touch with some um, relatives or some friends um, with another different name and we do find, you know, a, a link between one of these friends with some people with a Spanish name in Mexico or in Brazil, maybe it's a strong uh, um, tip, you know, to, to try to begin to, 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 to look for this person. The, proper, the property public uh, register and the, and the company's public register of countries of America. This is very important for us. Because sometimes these people has um, buy a house, um, has buy a, a, an apartment, you know, a flat, you know, has um, made a society, a company, a small society or maybe a company, and in this public register, we have found very, very interesting tips to, 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 to look for this terrorist. And finally, finally, the Interpol uh, search and the arrest warrants. Uh, just to know if these Interpol uh, shirts are alive or are closed, in these Interpol shirts you can find sometimes specific details about the about the, this criminal. Uh, maybe in the Interpol, Interpol shirt you can find this person uh, across uh, Brazil or this person was, uh, some, some sources say this person was living in Mexico, you know, and this Interpol shares and other warrants are very, very interesting for us to find to find uh, information. Okay, and the, the third the third um, step, the final step, go after the terrorists. Of course, uh, we go after the terrorists when we are, we are completely sure that this criminal is living in America. Uh, we are a very, very long team, just two persons, Joaquin and me, uh, but you know, <laughs> you know the situation at the newspaper now, um, this, this is an expensive uh, trip, you know, uh, flights, uh, hotels, um, one partner to take video, to take picture of the criminal, um, meals, you know, these kind of trips are very, very expensive and we have to be completely sure that don't want to, we don't want to make a mistake and we don't want to go back to the newspaper to the país and to say sorry uh, this criminal is not a, a criminal this is a person with the same name sorry we don't have nothing uh, excuse me we have uh, spent a lot of money in this stupid uh, trip okay and why um, uh, before 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 go to to America to Mexico to uh, Brazil or to another country we have to use some tricks, some um, specific and important tricks, but for us has been very, very important that you cannot imagine. For example, phone calls. Phone calls, um, sometimes with uh, female voices, because sometimes female voices give more confidence to this person who are living completely alone in a small flat, uh, trying to, you know, to, to have a new, new life, you know. And sometimes this kind of um, calls um, of um, female voices uh, offering the criminal, for example, um, change the, the, the 
the company form or sell some marketing, uh, you know, uh, you know, doing this kind of, of course that's very, very usual. But um, you try to do this kind of course sometimes, you know, to, 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 to hurt the accent of the criminal. If this person is a Spanish man or is a Mexican man or is a Brazilian man, to try to be completely sure that this is the person that we want to, 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 to you know, to, 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 to find, no? And of course, for example, to know if there is somebody inside the house, because maybe we have the address for the small flat for the house where the criminal has been living, but we don't know if there are anybody living inside. We call to the flat, we call to the house, but we need to, to not make mistake in this call because maybe this call will be destroy completely our investigation, okay? Uh, just in when only, only, when only we travel to America, when you are completely sure, completely sure, not 100%, but completely sure, that um, the, the person uh, is the criminal and we have to pay them and try to go to, to finish the, the investigation. Okay, the results. The results. Um, the first, the first result came um, very late. Uh, two years after uh, we began the investigation. Uh, this is the reason, for example, why you didn't tell anything to our bosses. You can imagine if you go to your boss and you tell him, "Okay, I, I would like to try to investigate the uh, the famous." Uh, this, Fire right criminals who left Spain long time ago, 40 years ago. Nobody knows where I'm living, but I am going to, to find him because I am a very, very good journalist. Please give me two, two years to, to completely free to do that. This is the reason why we didn't do anything about our bosses, about this project, you know, after we have the result. Okay, the first result came in 2015, Jose Gregat. He was living in the Republic of Dominicana. He was living completely free, you cannot imagine, working in a family construction company in Santo Domingo. And we tried to, to, to photograph him, you know, to take a picture of him, but it was impossible. We tried to, to talk to him, but it was impossible. We failed, but we brought the article about this man, saying this man who uh, is, is the responsible of the murder of one person long time ago uh, is living completely free and can in the Republic of Dominican. Okay. The second, the second result was, you cannot imagine, the most important result for us. I am going to explain you why, and, and you understand. This um, person, this person is, is a very, very famous criminal in Spain, because this person um, was the head of the commando the head of the commando who organized and who ordered and to place him a bomb in my newspaper, in the Paris newspaper, long time ago. Uh, when the bomb exploded, uh, one person uh, died, one of my partners died. Of course, at this time, I was a very, very young man. I was studying at university, you know. I am not it was launched a long time ago, 45 years ago. The bomb, um, 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 one person died at the newspaper, and another, another employee was very, very serious uh, injured. Jose de las Heras, um, this person, this criminal, was the responsible of uh, another three murders and, and dozens of um, people injured in, in different terrorist attacks. Uh, we, we, um, this person put uh, this bomb in our newspaper, in the newspaper, in, in the 90s. Why? Because um, the newspaper, the Paris newspaper, then represent for this criminal that they hate completely. You understand? No? The different ideology. Uh, the Paris was uh, a liberal newspaper, you know, was uh, the, the most important newspaper in Spain at the beginning of the democracy, and this criminal hate completely. The uh, we found this criminal in Guarujá, in a very, very small um, 
Fabila, um, in Guarujá, three hours by car from Sao Paulo. Uh, we took him a lot of pictures before I try to, 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 to can see the picture. Uh, and after that, we have a very, very long conversation with this stupid and, and, and um, <laughs> incredible man because um, he won't uh, talk to us, uh, you know, his story. He didn't regret anything. He was completely sure about his past. It was, it was crazy. Okay. Um, another, another result. We have to, to, to wait for more gifts. This is the reason why it's impossible to tell your boss. I am going to try to find another. You know, because please go away. Try to, try, try to find another job in another newspaper. You can, you can work in El Pais, okay? But you're, you know, very calm, very quiet, without any, any pressure. Uh, it's possible to do this kind of uh, crazy investigation. We will wait for more years, waiting to, to the next target. The next target was Jesus Melardes. We found him in, in 2019. Uh, this person was uh, sentenced for the Spanish justice to 14 years. Uh, we found this uh, terrorist in Paraguay. Paraguay is very important to explain you in Paraguay because Paraguay was the, 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 you know, the, the best, the more important um, 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 country for this kind of criminal. Because long time ago, 40 years ago, the dictatorship, Alfredo Stroessner used to help this kind of people. And this is the reason why these people and another has been living completely free in Paraguay. Menardes was living like, a, was running a, a model agency. He told us I was a model because I am a very, very pretty man. <laughs> and um, he was running a security, a security uh, company. We speak, we spoke, sorry, uh, to him by phone uh, twice, long time. And he, of course, didn't regret anything about his past. The, the last one, the last one, the result was Inigo de Guinea and Daniel Fernandez, both are very, very important terrorists in Spain because both um, are accused of two murders in, in Spain in, in, in long time ago. Um, despite the Interpol uh, warrants, both were living completely free that you cannot imagine, one of them in Mexico, in, in Mexico DF, in, in the capital, and the other in Leon, Guanajuato. Um, they have not changed their names, they had some uh, societies and company, and they were living like a normal person without any 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 any, any problems. In, to work in Mexico was very very difficult for us, you know, because the security in Mexico is terrible, and we have to try to you know to uh, wait in front of the house few days. We had to change our car. Twice, we had to change the photographer um, um, twice, first one man uh, and the second a uh, woman, because the neighbors used to call the local police and say, there are three strange persons in front of my house in a very small car, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and the local police came and what are you doing? No, oh, no, I am waiting on a friend. And we have to change the place, we have to change the car, we have to change the photographer. The photo, the, 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 you know, the photographer has to be completely alone in some, inside the car, trying to take a picture of them. It was impossible to take a picture of them in Guanajuato. Guanajuato, you know, Guanajuato, Leon is a, is a sensitive um, uh, city, you know. Yeah. Talking about security, and it was very difficult to take a picture of, of, of Daniel Fernandez in, in, in the capital. Anyway, we uh, had a very long conversation with Inigo de Guinea by phone twice, and of course, like the, the others, he told us, uh, I, am a very, I, I was a very young man, uh, I am innocent, uh, uh, I, I didn't regret anything about my ideas. Okay, um, I am finished. Where? Where do you publish our work? In the paper edition, of course. 
in, in the digital edition with a special video of the whereabouts of this criminal has been living and with a phone conversation with them, you know. This is interesting because you can, you know, you can have the, 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 the sensitive. And finally, we did a special um, documentary. If you are interested in this documentary, you can find it. It's 15 minutes in YouTube. And I finished the objective. The objective for the victims and the relatives about the whereabouts of the borders. They want to know where the criminal of the, uh, of the you know, of the, your family. Denounce the impunity of criminals and remember the murders because everybody has, um, have, um, um, you know, uh, nobody talk about this uh, criminal uh, terrorist attack and show if the police could have located them, if they had wanted, especially the local police from America, and try to get guys to reopen it. We, we failed in this case. We didn't, we, we, we didn't fail. And finally, just to say that the investigation is not over. From our initial list, we have another two terrorists to locate. A week in work in this crazy uh, story. And in, we hope that in a few weeks, maybe before Christmas, we are going to, to publish the result of one of them. And this is all. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you Jose. A fascinating example. I think of classic investigative journalism to show how it's different from day-to-day -day, uh, journalism and reporting. Uh, you have the patience to work for decades on, on one story, uh, you do undercover work, and you also supplement the work of the judiciary in, in your country because they are not going after their criminals. Uh, all very, very uh, important stuff. Um, the next speaker is um, Catherine Porter, and she is going to look at the history of Haiti, uh, the world's first country to abolish slavery and become independent, and still paying for it because of the reparations they had to make to France, but uh, another really dramatic investigation into the past of, of Haiti and, and the, um, the relations with the, the, the French. Thank you, um, and please. Hi everyone. Um, nice to see so many people here. Um, thank you to the organization for inviting me. It's, it's amazing to be here with more than 2,000 journalists. You have a moment of thinking that maybe the industry is not dying. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about a very odd investigation. Um, and it's very different than the one you just heard. It's investigating a 200-year-old crime and its ramifications. So this is a New York Times project. In the end, it was one story told in four parts. The first story was 9,000 words. Just to put that in context, it was basically a book. There was also a graphic. The first bibliography of a story that the New York, anyone at the New York Times remembers ever publishing, which by itself was more than 5,000 words long, and at a time when our, you know, usually I can't write more than 1,200 words in the newspaper, so getting a bibliography of 5,000 words is pretty incredible. Um, it was translated into French, which is pretty typical now of stories that touch on France. But for the first time in the New York Times history, we translated all five pieces into Creole. And both the French and the Creole were free online. So our hope was, and in the end we were right, that people, journalists um, in Haiti, uh, the, the journalism um, atmosphere there is really driven by radio. And we wanted to get the story into the hands of disc jockeys and, and radio journalists to read. Um, and to write story or to, to, to discuss basically, um, which they did um, because they could access it for, for free. Um, in terms of readership, uh, we knew that within the first couple days, more than three million people had come into the story and stayed for a matter of minutes at least, which I'm sure you know. I'm sure all of your places have these, you know, metrics that are not just 
how, whether someone's clicked on your story, but how long they've stayed on it. It showed that it had impact and people did read. So unlike the El Pais history, for whatever reason, the New York Times invested a huge amount of resources into this story. There were four reporters on it. I worked on it for more than a year. There were, we hired researchers, many of them in Haiti, but also across France um, and the United States. At the time I was living in Canada, I hired someone to help me sort through ge genealogical records there. This was in the middle of COVID, so to get people to go into archives in France required some time. Um, people, a journalist or, or historians in certain regions to go and look into the archives. There were 14 of them. We interviewed more than 165 people. We read more than 200 books and scholarly articles. We consulted, like you see, libraries and archives. Um, and I'll tell you more about the last two stats as we go on, but we had 20 experts review our financial calculations. And for the first part alone, which I wrote, we had 16 historians check and debate the main assertions that we made. I'll, and like I say, I'll tell you that about that more later. So my point was it was a huge lift. And um, while I'm here talking about it, and I'm very proud of this work, I also am very lucky to work at a place that decided to invest those type of resources into a 200-year-old crime. The story, so I'll try to do this quick. I am very passionate about Haiti. I think any of you who have been to Haiti um, are likely very passionate about it, and its history is incredible. Um, before Haiti was Haiti, it was the most important slave colony in the world. It was called saint domingue It provided most of the, uh, the, it was the biggest provider of both coffee and sugar, which was basically oil and water of, the, of that time for all of Europe. It was considered the most rich colony, made many people fabulously rich, but also the most brutal. Most enslaved people did not last more than five years after arriving. And in fact, between 1785 and 1790, 37% of the transatlantic slave trade ended up on this tiny corner of an island in the Caribbean. 1791, two years after the French Revolution, the, the enslaved people rose up and they led the first slave revolt, uh, revolt in, a modern, in, in, in modern history that succeeded and declared themselves free. Decades before freedom came to enslave people in the United States and even Britain. Um, but it was frozen out. The United States would not recognize Haiti because, well, for certain obvious reasons, they were worried about their own enslaved people rising up. France certainly wouldn't recognize it, and nor, nor at the time would Britain, because for the same very reasons, it was a really damaging and scary example. At the basis of the story is what happened in 1825. A new king of France, Charles X, arrived, or sent a flotilla of warships to Haiti um, with an ultimatum saying, either you pay us or we will block you out. We will declare war. And so the president of Haiti agreed. Um, and what was really, and at the time he agreed to 150 million francs which later, about 10 years later, was reduced to 90 million. Um, you know, in retro when we think about this now, it's completely outrageous. Our ideas of reparations are, in fact, the inverse. You do not have slave owners getting paid for their lost property. In fact, we think of it as the inverse. We also do not have the winners paying the losers for, the, for a lost war. But this was the case, that this era in Haiti. To pay back just that first installment, that first loan, the Haitian government took out a loan from some young French banks. Um, and that sparked a new type of banking system in Paris, but it put them deeper in debt because they couldn't even pay the first of five installments. So why the story started? 
this was not supposed to be an investigation. This was supposed to be the nut graph of a narrative story I was writing. I started going to Haiti after the earthquake and had been back. I've been back more than 30 times. Um, my life is very entwined with, uh, with people there, many of my friends. I have family members there now, too. So um, when my boss asked me, you know, why is Haiti such a disaster? I brought up this, what was known as the independence debt, but I call a ransom. This ransom that is known, that is spoke about in Haiti, but has never really been spoken about in France, certainly, and not really in the United States or the rest of the world. This is forgotten history. So my idea was to find the descendants of a Haitian that had paid for generations this debt to the descendants of the French family that got the money and hopefully look on the same piece of land because lots of the towns and villages in Haiti are named after the former colonists. So I had this idea of doing a narrative story. The problem was I couldn't get the nut graph. I couldn't figure out how, you know, how much Haiti paid in the end, who it paid, when the payments ended, all the basic elements you would have in your nut graph of your narrative about, you know, why you're relearning the story. I couldn't find the answers to them. People would often talk about 90 million francs, but I was like, well, what, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean in today's money? What did it mean to the economy? H how much of the Haitian um, national, like, the, the regular budget did this take up? When did it end? Some of the papers I read saw, said it ended in World War II. Some said it was in the late 80s. Um, it became, I got deeper and deeper and deeper at reading more and more and more books. And in the end, we realized in fact, no one had done the nut graph. No one had done that research. So suddenly it went from being a narrative story looking at the history of Haiti and, and, it, and why, you know, through an intimate lens to an investigation into international relations that involved banks, like one of the biggest banks in France, the CIC, um, Citibank um, in, in the United States, and very many, uh, the French government, the Haitian government, and very many the French families, some of whom are still incredibly wealthy. In fact, not just French families, but families that are part of the royalty across Europe. We discovered that people like King Charles's first cousin um, came from a family that received these payments, Prince in Belgium. <laughs> Greek royalty. So um, it went from just me to two of us, and then eventually four of us working on to try and dig up the stories and basically flush out the nut graph. So if you're working for a year with four people, um, this is sort of, I was told to give you one on ones. So uh, one on one. Organization, absolutely key. I mean, I think on any project, and I'm sure you, you think the same, any project that lasts more than a year and has lots of, like, lots of documents involved, you need to have outstanding data collection and organization. But to, you know, at the time, it was during COVID. I was living in Toronto. Uh, my colleague Constant was in Paris. One colleague was uh, Salam was in uh, London and the other was in Belgium. So we were all um, far apart working on this. Like I say, we hired a lot of researchers in different places to take photos of documents so we could, but we needed to, to be able to keep track of it. When I had started this myself, I had done an Excel spreadsheet just doing a timeline that way, but it became unwieldy. If you're doing a timeline that starts in the 1730s and leads to today, Excel is pretty hellish. It gets, it gets way too big, way too quickly, or at least for my skills. We used Workflowy, which I would totally recommend for multiple reasons. A, you can basket things, so you collect the information in different, like you can click on each of these dots and go down to another dot and click on those dots and go down. You can do, um, if you can see there, we have talk to and read with hashtag. 
that means anyone can look at, you know, under in any document that, or any note they're putting in there, if they put talk to and read, it will all be collected into the same place. You can find what you're missing. You can flag your colleagues and what you want them to follow up with. You can mark down what you haven't read, for instance. It was, it was really important for us. We had a WhatsApp group. I mean, that seems pretty basic, but we did use it constantly. We had a shared Google Drive. We did, after my initial timeline, which was way too big, we did breakout timelines. And it was really, really, really important later on, particularly when you're writing, to be able to find those documents and find that stat. You know, you always are doing your research and you think, of course I'm gonna remember this. And then a year later you don't. You just have this like faint recollection of something, but you have no idea where it is. Storing almost any little insignificant, seemingly insignificant detail that might become important is really important, it is, is essential, I think, particularly for when you're writing. Um, and then we had regular meetings. Sources. So this is a totally different story than anything I have ever done. You know, I basically got a PhD in Asian history. I feel like I did. No one's given me, you haven't given it to me yet, but um, our sources were historians. You know, I got to know a lot of different historians. Um, I, they were wonderful in terms of offering um, their own archives, their own pictures of archives, tips on who else we should talk to, other sources in terms of books. I mean, these people have done their PhDs and they might be on a tangential um, uh, issue, but they're really, really important. Um, libraries, okay, so that's sort of obvious, but many of them are online and it was really key for us, like Gallica is the French National Library. Every, almost all of these historical books that we found, for instance, you know, the history of Saint-Domingue written by someone who lived there back in the 18, he, he wrote that book um, in the 1770s and 80s. We could get every tome of it on Gallica. Um, also, the University of Florida digital um, archives are incredible. We can find old, um, newspapers from Saint-Domingue that had things like um, escaped slave notices, so you could dig into sort of the history and, and fact check some of the history of um, of the brutality um, and document it of what people lived through. Um, uh, archives were amazing. So this is uh, a picture of a document we found in the land's archives, which is of the ship captain collecting the first payment in 1826. Um, and we were able to read how what he described happened on that boat. Um, and so, and archivists are really happy to have people come in. In fact, it turns out they don't have very many journalists and we're super excited to see us. We went to lots of different French archives. I mean, people like, in, the French love to document and keep their documents. And in fact, there's so many different kinds of archives that we went to that we didn't think we'd find anything, but we found huge scoops within our story. Um, collectors, so, you know, uh, we find it, found out about people who are heritage junkies, history junkies, and they, one of them gave us the initial account by the Baron of Macau, who was the guy sent by Charles X to Haiti to deliver the ultimatum. And he had a handwritten account by this man of what had happened. It had, you know, since we just around the time we published our story, they went to publish this account in a book. But we had it a year beforehand um, because he generously offered it. He, I think he had bought it on eBay or something like that. So you just never know when, um, when you're going to... Those, pe those people who are basically unpaid journalists and fascin fascinated by history have a lot of stuff. Um, guiding principles. So we just kept coming back to the central question, how much did Haiti pay? How much of its budget did it take up? And what was the long-term lasting effect of these payments on the country? Who got the money? Mm, and, um, and when did these payments end? We had to keep coming back because there's just so many rabbit holes, that are, some of which are totally delicious and you want to spend a lot of time down there. Um, but if you don't have someone keeping you disciplined, you could spend, you could do a PhD and spend more than a year, even with four of you on this type of story. 
Um, Matapuzo was an investigative uh, journalist at the Times. He's the head of the investigation unit now in, in London. And he was really keen on us getting scoops, so not just doing a history project, but getting scoops within it. So, you know, one of the documents, the one here from early 1900s, shows that even though the French government said that it never took any of this money, in fact, it pocketed um, millions of francs itself, which added up to, you know, millions of dollars in today's um, money. And so we were able to sort of point to the French government and have scoops within, within our story. Um, we were trying to keep players later. So there were a lot of French ambassadors that were around for the 2004 coup, in which Aristide had made a big deal about this debt, um, and he was suddenly whisked away on a, on a plane to the Central African Republic. Now, this many years later, like you said, people will talk. Um, they were uh, disarmingly frank about what you know what role they thought that this history actually played in the French involvement in the 2004 coup to remove Aristide. And then new analysis. So we couldn't find it for the nutcrafts. So we built it. We built a spreadsheet. Um, my brilliant colleague Constant Mahou was the one behind this. It went from 1925 right up until the late 90s um, in payments, we found that the last payment that we could see that was actually somehow linked to the initial independence debt was in the 50s, 1950s. And so through doing this type of spreadsheeting, and you can see how he's got colors there. Those are often links to where his sources was or were. Um, we've tried to have more than one source and for each cell here, and that's why all that archival in information, you know, like first we thought we were just looking for a report on this, but all of those archives allowed us to fill these cells and do the homework ourselves to figure out how much France paid. So in the end, France paid, um, uh, sorry, Haiti paid. In the end, Haiti paid um, in terms of, was, actually before I say that, so there was this initial loan in, in 1826 to pay the first installment. So in, in Haitian history, they call it the double debt, the, the independence debt or the ransom, and then this initial loan from bankers to pay for the first installment. But there were later loans in the 60s, um, and there were loans in the 90s, and there was a loan in the 1910s, and then the United States got involved, and it pushed its own loan in the 20s during its occupation of Haiti. In fact, what we found was, even though this debt officially ended, you know, the last colonists were paid in, in 1888, the legacy of this debt continued, like I said, and, until basically today. Haiti became a place that was known that it was poor, but you could get rich off of it. And, you know, first it was the French bankers, and then it was the American bankers who um, pushed the State Department to invade um, and occupy the country to secure their own financial investments and to push their own loan. It set a pattern. And what we discovered by cross-referencing with the income of the Haitian government we were able to get from archives in Haiti, that some years it absorbed more than 40% of the country's budget. Um, so where did it go? I've already mentioned King Charles I's cousin, Maximilian Margrave, uh, Margrave de Baden. We learned that by, at this point, working with genealogists who helped us trace back who were the, who were the colonists who got these payments, who literally got these payments. Um, and we looked at the sort of ones about the most, the richest ones, and tried to trace forward seven, six to seven generations who was alive today to figure out who they were, and whether their family knew anything about it, whether this was history in their own family. And we discovered quite a bit of royalty, including, as I mentioned, King Charles's cousin, but Michel de Lenne from uh, the Belgian prince, the last Duke of Luchtenberg. And um, we discovered that um, most knew nothing about this. In fact, this history has been completely erased. French government, the French curriculum does not include it. In fact, only 10% of French students learn about the Haitian Revolution, let alone the independence debt. It's not 
taught uh, it's the, the the banks that made all the money do not include it in the timeline. They don't have any information about it in their archives. They do not recognize it. This is history that's inconvenient and has been silenced, um, buried, or just ignored. So. You know, once we had a lot of that detail, we then I went, then went back to Haiti and I chose to go to the Don Don, which is the coffee making, historic coffee making region of, of Haiti. It was the first place in, during Saint Domingue where they cut coffee trees. And it still is a coffee making center of the country. In order to try and tie this history to today's people and talk to them about it, but also look at how they live. So in a place like Don Don, this guy is actually sitting on a, a former, um, uh, water cistern for uh, uh, coffee tree plantation that's up in the mountains. You can see. Um, so it was it was very interesting to go there because this place that made so many people rich for three centuries doesn't have running water, doesn't have electricity. The road is uh, not paved, and most people we talked to, like many in Haiti couldn't afford to send their kids to school because the public school system is so um, pathetic. It's almost all private in Haiti, more than 80%. Um, uh, we, visit, we tied the story to a one family, a coffee family run by a woman, and her husband um, was going blind but couldn't afford to go to um, a doctor because all of that is also paid. Um, and so it felt really important to us to not just tell the history, um, and try and break this myth about why Haiti is so effed up and, and point some deeper reasons as to what it, why is Haiti, as people say, a basket case. In fact, it was so underdeveloped and so poor. Um, and it, there's reasons beyond um, some of the ones that are often talked about, corruption, which is true, obviously, um, and mismanagement, but there's a deeper story. If you're doing a story that has that many words and you're you're straining it, you're going straining into historians' territory, you better get it right. My editor made me fact check the first story twice. And I've never done it quite this way, but I literally did it like it was um, a, like a paper I was giving in, in, in university, a history paper. Each fact was footnoted and a color if it was pink, it meant that it was clear, I had more than two sources on it. If it was yellow, it was suspect, and maybe we should chuck it. Um, because, you know, uh, we are journalists. We normally report what we see today. We don't go, go into historical terrain, and there are lots of experts who will point out something wrong. We just did not want to be wrong in any of this. And then we went back to the expert. This is the only photo we have of us going back to the expert, so it's a horrible photo. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is Constant, um, the guy who did the spreadsheet. And he was um, going back to financial um, debt experts to, to work through his methodology um, and find out what the reaction was, see if they saw any errors, um, see if he had made any, um, any mistakes along the way, or if they would push back on the methodology. So this seemed really like showing people, your readers, yourself naked, you know, like before you got dressed, and we don't normally do that. But I think it's really smart, actually, and it's something you could do, like we should all do in our work generally, is showing people what you're going to report before you report them, report it, who are experts, and then you can include their analysis in your piece. So this allowed us to say, you know, 15 of the top experts in the world on this agreed with our methodology, and some said it was even modest. Two said it was even too modest when we, when we were able to say, you know, that Haiti, in today's term, had spent $21 to $115 billion paying back this debt. And like I said, too, I went back to historians, that, not necessarily ones that I had interviewed for the piece, but people that I had read their books and I admired and I knew they were experts, and I went through all of the main assertions, these sweepy type of statements that I put, like Haiti being the, the, the country that provided the most coffee and sugar to Hamburg coffee houses and there, little things like that, but I, I presented them to 16 historians. And it also just helped me feel bulletproof by the time I was published, we published. And I think 
um, it's something that I will take forward, going forward um, for other stories, not even deeply historical ones, but just any story you do. And the last thing I'd say is like, this is, uh, obviously it's a really big heft, heft uh, of lift, and it was um, a big newspaper that decided, that had some resources and poured it into it, and it's not necessarily transferable to lots of different uh, workplaces. Um, but I think these type of stories are si often sitting in plain view. You know, there was a story in the Times the other day about adoptions from South Korea. And the adoptee is going back and discovering that the paperwork was fabricated back in the 60s. And that their parents, you know, hadn't actually given them up. They were stolen. That seemed like a story, like there's a myth in South Korea up until that point that this was a success and all these kids were sent off and they're better off. But in fact, it was theft. There's stories about the uh, re uh, reservation schools in the United States that have just come out too. Um, and where I'm from, Canada, a similar schooling system. These, you know, that, that is ignored history in your country. Um, that you could be digging into and trying to change the bigger narrative about who, you know, how we see ourselves, how we talk about ourselves, and um, and what happened. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> from the poor country in the Western Hemisphere to a poor country in the Eastern Hemisphere, my own, Nepal. Um, Nepal is known as a country of Montevers, Himalayas, great scenery, but very few people know that there was a conflict there um, between 1996 to 2006. Uh, armed struggle inspired by Mao Zedong and uh, the revolution next door to our country in China. Um, but the war is not in our history books, a bit like what uh, you said about Haiti. Uh, the French History books do not have this in their history books, and neither does our history books have anything to do with our conflict that lasted 10 years. Um, and the reason is that the protagonists, the former enemies, are now the state. They are fighting the coalition together, which is a great thing if you consider that they are reconciled, but they also want to bury the past, and especially their war crimes. Um, and this project that I'm going to show you, uh, which I got involved with, is basically journalism, although it came out as curated books. It uses photojournalism and photography to document what had happened in order that uh, we set the history right. Uh, it might be an example for other countries uh, in the post-conflict situation for uh, reconciliation as well. Um, <clears throat> So I'll go through uh, very briefly the uh, recent history of Nepal. As you know, sandwiched between India and China uh, in the mountains. Uh, the conflict itself was from 1996 to 2006. 17,000 people were killed. Uh, there are 1,400 still listed as missing. Um, in my newspaper, we covered the conflict. And I was the editor in the last 23 years until I stepped down last year. But we got a ringside seat of the conflict, and it was front page news for most of those uh, uh, years after between 2000 and 2006. But somehow the format of journalism and the content that journalism needs from, from reporters was not enough to get into the bottom of what the war was doing to us. Um, and um, we decided uh, just before the 10th anniversary of the conflict in 2005, December, and then we should do a photo book to document what had happened because it looked like it would go on for another few decades with many, many more killed. Mm -hmm. So we started working on a book. Uh, we made an ad in the papers to ask for photographs from people, journalists, anyone. 3,000 pictures were sent in and we curated 189 of them. Uh, I'm not a photographer myself, so I got the help of two international, we recognized photographers in National Geographic in time, and to help me with the technical selection. And then we brought out the book, but it took time for the book to be, uh, to come up. And during that time, there was a ceasefire and the war ended. So a lot of people told us, no need for the book, the war is over. 
But as we all know, the end of war does not mean peace. And uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of people who didn't have closure yet. Um, the focus of the book and the pictures which I'll show you here from inside the book uh, was on civilians who were caught in the middle. In most wars, modern wars, 90% of the casualties are civilians, killed, disappeared, displaced. Uh, this was a photograph of a funeral of 56 soldiers who were killed in an army base. But, uh, the attention here is on the grandmother who had come to cremate her grandson. Um, a mother who had, the son had been disappeared by the uh, insurgents for the last four months is showing a citizenship paper of her son to a photographer. He was not a trained photographer, but he made a brilliant portrait. And this is before digital, so this was an idiot proof camera. Um, a female gorilla on sentry duty on a mountain top. You can see the fatigue of war on her face, as well as it highlights the involvement of women in the Maoist militia. Another picture of a Maoist female gorilla in a mass meeting up in the mountains. We had to really decide which pictures were too graphic, and this was sort of the borderline. Um, again, the focus is on the woman who's found her dead husband's body among the casualties the morning after a battle. Two 16-year-olds who were widowed because 18 people in her village were massacred by the army. They thought they were rebels and one of them was a baby. Five-year-old and seven-year-old who were burnt in a bus attack, firebombed, their mom was killed. <coughs> mom and daughter gaining the blood from uh, outside their shop after one of the fiercest battles in central Nepal in 2004. Uh, this looks like an ordinary picture of a school teacher in a village school up in the mountains until you read the caption and you find out that his hand was chopped off at the very beginning of the conflict. Uh, but the most moving picture for me was a photograph of two photographs uh, in the pocket of a dead soldier taken by a helicopter pilot who happened to always be at the scene of the battle the next morning. And uh, obviously the soldier is the one on top and his family at the bottom. Uh, the ceasefire on April 24th, uh, April 26th, 2006, this baby was born on the day of the ceasefire. And she is a former guerrilla with uh, shrapnel in her head who deserted the Maoists and went with her husband who's also a guerrilla up in the mountains because they would have been killed if uh, they had deserted, if they had found that they had deserted. But anyway, she had a baby on the day of the ceasefire. It's a lot of hope for the future. And the book came out in January 2007, um, became an instant hit, uh, sold like hotcakes. Publisher didn't want to make a lot of money out of it, so we decided to go on a tour of the whole country with the book, with the pictures, take the pictures to the people. That's me pretending to drive the truck with the pictures. And that's our route all over the country, and we were passing through scars of war with the bombed out bridges that were being reconstructed, landmine highways that had just been reopened. We put up the photographs amidst the ruins of the conflict, so it became not just a photo exhibition, but an installation art. This was a hospital that was destroyed. Um, when we thought there would be 2,000 visitors, there would be 20,000, we had to extend the number of days where they, where they came. It was not just the number of people, but the intensity of emotion with which they looked at the photographs, because almost everyone had been affected in one way or the other. Former guerrillas came to see the pictures, army captains, wounded in war. Uh, there was an outpouring of testimonies by visitors who had to add a number of guest books. Uh, school children who hadn't told their parents what they had been through, parents who hadn't told their kids what they had been through. It all came out. The whole exhibition tour became cathartic for uh, many Nepalis. So the testimonies. People would go home and come back the next day and transcribe their poem or essay or their experiences. 
So if they could not read or write like this elderly couple, they would dictate it to us. So these were such important testimonies, we decided that was a real people's history of the war. So second book was became important, and which was called Never Again, because that, that phrase Never Again was in almost every testimony that we uh, collected. And um, until we found out that after almost every modern war, people have said Never Again. And towards the end of the exhibition, too, we started seeing people who looked familiar uh, among the visitors. And that's the mom and daughter, five years later, coming to see their own picture in their village. And when the war is over for four years, so they, she looks happier, and the girl is much bigger. Um, one of the exhibitions also saw the reunion of the photographer with the character in the book. Uh, and she said she had come to see it in the exhibition of pictures of her son, who will still remain missing five years later. Remember the girl on the hilltop? Well, after the war, we tracked her down, found her name. She's the one in the blue. But until we found out that her brother, the guy on the right, was in the army. So brother and sister were on opposite sides. That really demanded a third book, which, which wasn't planned. But this is a much more uplifting book. It came out in 2011. We followed up on some of the people in the first book and their real stories, because the first book only had very short captions, but the real story was here, I'm including this family's story. Um, she was very difficult to track down because you could see her face. It took a lot of investigation to find her. Um, finally tracked her down to a shop by a highway. She had been disowned by her family after her husband died. She only got a part of the compensation. The guy with the Hand chopped off and still teaching 20 years later. The woman um, was, uh, the men folk had been killed in the village. Five years later, she looks 20 years older. The teenagers with the baby, five years later, she looks like she's 60. And she's still wearing the same shirt. Cradling a gun. Ten years later, she was cradling a baby in this uh, demobilization cage. The ceasefire baby is four years old. She looks like a girl, but she's actually a boy. Actually a boy. With the cover picture of the book, with the photographer handing a copy to the boy. Up there in the blue teddy bear t shirt. And five years later, wearing a Britney Spears t shirt. Not um, taller there. We also made a documentary film based on the tour, part of the tour, called Frames of War, which we took around the country as well to show. And we keep following up on some of them. Uh, the woman on sentry duty ultimately got inducted into the National Army. One of the models of peace process is that the two armies also got um, merged into one another. So, another example of. Reconciliation. Thank you very much. Thank you.